What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I looked upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. Praise God. I look forward to that day. I look forward to that day with everything in me because I'm going to see Jesus. And it's going to be all right then. You realize that? It's going to be all right then. There's nothing to fear once I see him. Amen. The only thing, I guess you could say the only thing I have to fear is not loving him now. The only thing I have to fear is failing him and not loving him like I should now because if I do that, if I fail to love him like I should now, when I see him face to face, there will be no hiding the fact that I lived as though I didn't love him when I was here. And some people say, well, you wouldn't go to heaven if you didn't act like you loved him down here. Oh, I, I dare say we've mistreated all kinds of people that have loved us. That's part of being a sinner. And we've certainly mistreated our Savior. Amen. Would you all agree with that? We've injured our relationship with ourselves. I mean, you can't injure because he doesn't change. His love is eternal. His love is forever. But boy, we've blown it at times, haven't we? Mm-hmm. We sure have. And you know what we blow it most? I think we blow it most of the time in. You know what we do the worst in? I believe we do the worst when it comes to prayer. In our relationship with God, if I examined my entire Christian life, every aspect of it, I would probably come to the conclusion that I fail most in prayer. I don't know how it is with you, but that's the way it is with me. Dr. John R. Rice, who wrote probably the greatest book on prayer that I've ever read, he said, all of your failures are prayer failures. And I believe that with everything in me. If we look in the book of James, we find that God said, you have not because you ask not. Amen? Amen? God tells us to ask. God tells us to to uh, bring to him the desires of our heart. God wants us. He encourages us. He invites us all through his word to ask him for things. Am I right? Okay. And and what we I was li- matter of fact I was listening to a, one of my one of my favorite messages on prayer just this week, just a couple of days ago. I before I even well, before I even got settled on on this morning's message, I, I knew I, I I knew it was coming up, but I really had put it off in thinking about it uh, as much as I should have. And I listened to that message uh, by Dr. Curtis Hudson on prayer, and uh, it really touched my heart again afresh. hadn't listened to it in many years, and uh, that, he was quoting Dr. Rice on that. And he told he told us he told a number of stories about how God had answered his prayers. Uh, he he uh, and I'm trying I'm trying to sit here thinking about several of them, but one of them where he had missed his where he had missed his uh, he missed his turn off on the way back. I don't want to say he was in Chicago and he was going back home to Nashville and he was he was on I-65 and and uh, he meant to turn off and but there was two or three trucks in the lane to his right and he couldn't exit off and and uh, he had to get gas. And well, and then he saw a sign that said it was like 12 miles to the next gas station. And his truck ran out of gas, pulled over onto the shoulder, and he said, "What am I going to do now?" He said, and he said, just as I was about to turn the key and try it, he said, a little voice inside me said, "Curtis, there's there's just a little bit of gas left in the carburetor, and if you turn turn that key and and, and you try to start it, then when you do get some gas, you go out to prime that thing and get it started back again." He said, he "said Don't do it." And I thought, "Well, yeah, you're right, self." But he said, "But you're not trusting God, are you?" And he prayed about it. He said, I turned the key and it cranked back up. He said, so I'm put, putting down the shoulder of the road real slow. He said, and then I got convicted. I said, Lord, I ain't trusting you at all. 
I asked you, I told you, Lord, I, I didn't mean, he prayed. See, he prayed ahead of time. He said, Lord, help me get to the gas station. And uh, he said, you know, I, I, you're not trusting God at all. So they're put, putting down the shoulder. He said, I just pulled out the traffic. Wah! He said, you know what? He said, I, I made it the next 12 miles to the gas station. He said, as I was coming down the off ramp, I thought about killing it and coasting in. <laughs> He said, but I just went on, pulled on up to the tank. He said, now, he said, you may not believe that. He said, but I'm going to tell you, I put more in that thing than the manual said it'll hold. <laughs> he said, but I packed her pretty good. But see, God answers prayers. Amen. We were talking this morning before we started, and I know people that wouldn't, they weren't privileged to hear what we were talking about this morning, but, but uh, our good friend, missionary brother Richard Miller, who's been a missionary since the 70s to, uh, to Papua New Guinea, and uh, Fiji, and he's done a tremendous work over there, uh, establishing uh, Bible Bible institutes, and uh, and responsible for the. Uh, and I say he he didn't personally start, but because of his ministry and the men who who started churches under him, who have started churches, because of his initial work there, there's been over a hundred churches, and probably way more than that by now, started as a result of his work. Tremendous missionary. And tremendous man of God and and uh, faithful servant, and uh, and we were just talking this morning about how uh, he was laying in a bed or in, in agony with a torn disc in his back. Had been to a number of neurologists and specialists down in in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana area, and uh, they recommended surgery and they recommended some kind of a shot in his back, and he just been praying and calling on calling on people in in the churches that he that he uh, frequents to uh, to pray for him, and, and uh, he woke up the other morning healed. God had healed his back, and that's, we just want to give God glory this morning. I want to tell, just want to tell folks out there that God is a healing God. God is a God of, of answering prayers. Amen. God, God wouldn't tell us to ask for something if he wasn't going to answer. So I want us to look this morning, Luke chapter 11, and we're going to, we're going to read, we're going to, we're going to focus this morning on um, on verses 1 through 13. We finished up last week with Mary and Martha in chapter 10 of Luke, and we talked about that, about how uh, Martha was worried and fretting over stuff that didn't need to be fretted over, and Mary just simply wanted to get next to Jesus and learn. And, uh, you know, we talked about the Martha spirit, uh, which is, is full of flesh, full of pride. She wanted to put on a dinner party and impress Jesus. She was more worried about everything looking right than she was what was going on, on the inside. And Mary, uh, Martha was a believer, but she was doing things wrong. And Mary came to sit at the feet of Jesus. She loved him, and she wanted to. She wanted to learn. And uh, and if we love the Lord Jesus, there ought to be a desire in us to sit at His feet and learn from Him. Amen. <laughs> All right. So Luke chapter 11, get your Bible out. If you haven't got a Bible in front of you, you need to get one. You need to open it up to Luke chapter 10 and read along. Uh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 11 and read along with me this morning. Uh, you know, if we were going to work on a house and do some carpentry work, we wouldn't do it without a hammer and a saw and uh, nails. You need the proper tools for the job. And if we're going to go and study the Bible, we need the Bible. Amen. Luke chapter 11, and we're going to read. I'm going to read verses 1 through 13, and we're going to go back and talk about it. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, 
Yet because of his importunity will he rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask fish, will he get for a fish give him a serpent? Or he, if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you this morning, Lord, for this time that, that our church can gather together and meet. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this precious time. Lord, I pray that, that the Holy Spirit of God be in control of everything that's done here this morning. Lord, flesh can't do it. Flesh can't even get involved. Lord, if my flesh is involved, this message will be all for nothing. Lord, if our flesh is involved while we're trying to listen, it's going to be all for nothing. Lord, the Bible tells us that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. Lord, may we get out of our flesh and may we seek your face. May we come, Lord, with not this world on our mind, Lord, but but heaven. Lord, may we come with a willing, submissive spirit that wants to sit at your feet like Mary, that wants to hear from you and let the words of truth bathe bathe our frazzled consciences and our frazzled lives, Lord, and and soothe us like like a healing balm. Father, I pray, Lord, that the truth would wash over us this morning and help us to understand that we have access to God's own throne. Lord, may we realize that and, and get that conceptualized in our minds to where we can understand our standing with you. Lord, that we can understand that the, the key to the door of, of all the things that we need are there through the through the door of prayer. Lord, we, we, we have the key. It's right here in front of us. Lord, you told us what to do. And Lord, it, it, we can open that door and find the things that we need. Lord, teach us to understand how to pray. Lord, I just pray, Father, that it impress upon each and every one of us a burning desire to renew and rekindle a vibrant prayer life. Lord God, I pray you forgive us of our failures up to this point. Holy Spirit of God, touch each one. Help us to understand now. May Jesus get all the glory. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Again, he said all your failures, all of them, are prayer failures. We fail when, when we, I've often quoted this little saying, it says we, when we fail to plan, we plan to fail. But when we fail to pray, we plan to fail. Because folks, let's just realize something. Jesus said, what did Jesus say? I'm, one of the most powerful sayings he put, he said in the word of God, he said, for without me, you can do nothing. He didn't say you can do some things. He said you can do nothing. And we may step back and fold our arms and say, well, I've done a lot in life. Really? Not without Jesus. i tell you right now. And you may say, well, I look around. I can see my accomplishments. I can see what I've done. Well, when you're in the grave, when that marble is sitting six feet above your head and you're standing before the Lord Jesus Christ, I promise you all those things you think are accomplishments you will not brag on before the Lord Jesus Christ. They will all turn to dust before him. They will all be wood, hay, and stubble, and they will amount to absolutely zero. Folks, we have access to God's throne. We have access to come into God's throne room and talk to God himself. There's no partition between us. Christ has took away the partition between us and God. Christ is our entry to God. Christ, everything we do, folks, I want you to understand this. God doesn't deal with you and your personality. God does not deal with you and your quirks and your faults and your flaws. God doesn't deal with that. If he dealt with us in that way, he'd see our sin. But you and I are covered. You and I are completely covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is covering us as far as God the Father looking at us. When God the Father hears a request, It doesn't go straight from us to God. It goes through Jesus. You see, nothing that we ask is going to get to God 
except for what comes through Jesus. And you may say, that don't make any sense. Well, the Bible talks over there in James about us asking a myth that we may consume it upon our lust. We ask for things we shouldn't ask for. Those requests don't get to God's throne. God's not going to say, well, what is this sinful request coming to me for? God's not doing that. Listen, if it's not for Christ, it don't get to God's throne. Amen? It don't, I mean, God's not going to respond unless it comes through Christ. Amen? He, I mean, everything we give to God, we're to give through Christ. It's, and you say, what does that mean? That means it should, be, it should be for his glory somehow. And if you're saying, well, I, what about me being healed? Well, what am I asking for healing for? Am I asking for healing so I can go party? Am I asking for healing so I can go play? Am I asking for healing so I, or am I asking for healing so I got more time on this earth to serve God? That ought to be our desire to be here anyway. If we can't serve God and we don't serve God, why are we even here? We have no purpose on this earth without serving God. I, I know that's a lot of things I'm throwing at you before I even begin, but I, I just want you to understand, we have an incredible access to come to God through Christ. Amen? So let's get into it this morning. Luke 11, verse 1, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, and I, and I, before we go into that, I, I, just, I just think about that. This disciple was listening to Jesus, the Son of God, communicating with his heavenly Father. He was, he was privileged to hear something that we've never been privileged to hear. He heard what prayer was supposed to sound like. Evidently, this disciple, and Jesus doesn't name what disciple it was, but this disciple must have felt very inferior in their prayer life. He must have felt like, I don't even understand how to pray compared to that. I want to be able to pray. I want to be able to talk to God like, like he's talking to God. It really touched him and, and made him realize what a puny little prayer life he had. And I say that realizing when I look at my own prayer life, I realize what a puny little prayer life I have when I compare it to what the way Jesus told us to pray. So let's look at how he told us. He, and this disciple, he said to him, he said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So like he's saying, you know, you know kind of like he did. You know, teach us. We want, we want to learn from you. And as if Jesus had to have a comparison. But he said unto him, he said, when you pray, here's what you say. Now let's take them. Let's break them down. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That word hallowed there is important. That word hallowed means reverence. We're I, I don't know how it is with you, but I feel like in this world, and I know we're not supposed to go off of feelings, but I, I, I genuinely feel like in this world, a lot of respect for God has been taken away. Satan has mocked God in so many ways uh, that it, it's almost as if there's not much respect for God left in this world. <laughs> I mean, you have to, you have to, I, mean, I, I was, I was, I was watching a, I was watching a football game last week and right after the game was a show called God Friended Me, was, which was going to come on. I didn't watch that garbage. I don't watch any I don't watch any of those programs. I don't agree with them. I don't approve of them. But they were, they were showing the show called God for Me. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to dehumanize. I mean, they're trying to humanize God, rather. They're trying to take God off his throne and make him a man. They're trying to make him just like everybody else. They're trying to, to, uh, to strip him of his deity and mock him in that way. Uh, so many ways in, in this world. I mean, people use and slang. There's a reason why the Bible says that we're not to use God's name in vain. That means not to take his, his name and make it a common thing. When people say, and I'm not doing this to mock God, take, understand that, but when people say, oh God, when something happens, that's taking God's name and using it for nothing. To, to, to say it that way, using it in a vain way that may, amounts to nothing. What we're doing, we're... we're, we're we're taking God and bringing him down to our level, and we should never, ever, ever do that. I got convicted about using the word awesome. We shouldn't use the word awesome to, uh, to really in life because 
what, unless we're talking about God, because God is the only one we should be in awe of, truly. He ought to be on a level above everybody and everything else. God deserves our reverence. He is our creator. He made everything. Our entire existence is, is because of him. Therefore, we should be in total awe of him. But not only that, we're to look at him very in a very similar fear that a child looks to their father on earth. I mean, that when we're brought up, when we're little kids, we're, you know, if, if I don't do right, I'm going to get in trouble. If I don't do right, I'm going to get disciplined. I, I don't want daddy to have to get on to me, so I'm afraid to do wrong because I don't want daddy to get, I don't want to get in trouble. I mean, we're to have that kind of a respect for God that keeps us not wanting to fall down, that keeps us not, and I'm not saying we can ever get past the fact that we're going to fall down sometimes because we're going to, as long as we're in these sinful bodies, these sinful bodies are going to sin. There's no doubt about that, but when we do, it ought to grieve us to our core that we've sinned against our Heavenly Father. We ought to have that fear. Oh, oh no, I have failed him. Oh, I need to seek his forgiveness. I need to make things right between me and my Father. That's that, that's that hallowed, that's what that word means. And and it's you notice when Jesus told us how to pray, he didn't say just go right in and start talking about what you need. He said come to him and respect him first. Come to him with respect. Hallowed be thy name. We ought to practice that. We ought to practice reverence. We ought to practice uh, treating God that way and getting back to that and getting away from this, this world's way of just using God as a, as a byword, a slang word, and not treat God that way. It's, it's, it's evil to do that. And we have, got, we have gotten, uh, as Christians, it was put to me very clearly a long time ago. It said, you know, we like, to, we like to hook our trailer on the trailer hitch of the world and stay a safe distance behind them. But no matter what we do, we always, we always end up right behind them. As the world moves more wickedly, the church moves right behind the world. We say, oh, we're not as bad as them. We're, we're, we're different than they are, but we're right behind them. We're not, we're not too far behind them. God help us because we let the world drag us down with their lowering of standards. And we inch toward them saying, well, we're not as bad. We're not that bad. God help us. God is to be hallowed. God is to be respected. God is to be feared. Thy kingdom come. What does that say? We're saying, Lord, we want you on the throne of everything. Not just our heart. Lord, we want your kingdom to expand in this whole world. Lord, we want we not that we not that I believe in some post millennial society how we're gonna just change this world for the better. No. I know some things have got to happen. I know the Lord's coming back for his church. I know that I know that the seven years of tribulation have got to take place. I understand all that before Jesus Christ comes back and he slays his enemies and sets up his throne in Israel for a thousand years. I know that's gonna take place, but we're to pray for God to come on and do that. Lord, please come on and do that. And until you do, Lord, I pray that your name is glorified in every corner of this earth. I pray, Lord, that in every family, in every household, in every daddy, in every mama, Lord, I pray that folks would come to know you. I pray that you'd become the king of every household. I pray, Lord, that, that you be put back on the throne in all these worldly, filthy churches that have turned their back on you and throwed your Bible out and brought in the world and its entertainment. Lord God, I pray that you, you, are, you are put back on the throne. That's, I don't be our, that's what Jesus is saying we ought to pray for. Can you imagine what that world would be like if people turned their hearts back to God? These kids in this room have never even experienced that kind of world. I, I I dare say I experienced a hair of it. I know it wasn't perfect, but it was so much better 40 years ago when I was a kid. It was so much better 60 years ago when some of y'all was kids. There was at least the fear of God. Businesses closed on Sunday out of fear of God. You couldn't buy alcohol on, on Sunday. Why? Out of the fear and respect of God. You couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't go get an abortion on demand in America. Why? Out of the fear and respect of God. 
Men and men couldn't marry. Women and women couldn't marry. Why? Out of the fear and respect of God. But that's not so anymore. We're to pray that God hurry and come on. We're to pray that his will be done as in heaven, so in earth. So what are we asking? We're saying, God, come on, take control of this mess. We're to pray for that daily. We're to give him the respect and pray for that. Give us day by day our daily bread. Listen, we're not to leave God out of things. Does that mean we shouldn't go out and work a job and try to make a living? No, that doesn't mean that at all. But you know what? When it all comes down to it, our existence, our survival, it ought to be in God. God's the one who gave us that job. God's the one who allowed us to have the intellect to work that job. A lot of times we forget that. We say, God didn't give me this job. I went and got this job. You wouldn't have been able to work this job if God hadn't put that brain in your head to allow you to think those thoughts and understand those things. God prepared you for that job or you wouldn't have it. You say, well, I, I make good grades and God ain't got nothing to do with that. Oh, yeah, God gave, well, God's the one who gave you the smarts to understand that. Lord, I need you in everything I do. Give me that daily bread. That's not just, hey, Lord, put food on my table every day. But that's provide for me. Provide for me. Listen, if we ever think that we're doing all this and we've got all this stuff in order, that's going to be the worst day of our life. That's going to be when we're headed for a fall. We need to forget. We, we need, I'm sorry, we need to not forget that it's God that sustains us. It's not us. Give us day by day. You know what that means? That means we shouldn't just act like, well, we're on cruise control. God's in control. We asked for God to take care of us a while back. No, God says we ought to do it day by day. By day. Every day is a new thing. Every day is a new day. Every day is a new creation and a new ending. We start all over when the sun comes up. and We get up and start our day. It's a new day with God. We need him today. Amen? We ought to be a praying people. One who goes back to the throne of God every single day with reverence, with, with, with an awe of God, with a with a supplication. And then what that means is asking for what we need. Oh, Lord, please give it to us. And notice the next thing he says, and forgive us of our sins. You know, there are people, and I, I'm amazed at these people. There are people, even amongst Baptist brethren, who believe we're going to get to some point where we don't sin like we, we, we don't sin anymore. Uh, I, I don't know they say we never sin, but oh, they'll get to a point where they, they hardly ever fall down. I mean, they're almost they're almost work, walking almost perfect. Some of them, if you if because and I and I say that because any time they see somebody do anything wrong, it's almost as if they condemn that person to hell. I'm gonna tell you something. Jesus would not have said to us to pray and forgive us of our sins if he didn't know we were going to sin. Is God promoting us sinning? Absolutely not. Does Christ promote us to sin? No. But does he realize we're still walking in these sinful bodies? Does he remember our frame? Does he know that we're dust? Yes, he does. And he knows that we're weak. And he knows that the pull of the flesh is powerful. Paul wrote about it. Paul wasn't talking about something in his past. He was talking about something in his present. We need to pray because we are weak. We need his strength. Christ has all power and all authority. And if he is the one who is our guiding force and he is our power in us, then God, then God, God will guide us and we will walk in a way that's pleasing unto him. But yes, we're going to fall down every now and then. And when we do fall down, we need to go to him immediately and we need to do it daily. We need to do it when it, in a case-by-case -case basis and not let it build up. This is what Christ is saying. Every day you need to talk to God about the sin that was in your life. Every day you need to seek forgiveness. Because listen to me, when we sin against God, and we don't sin against anybody but God, we don't sin against, you may say, well, I hurt so-and-so. You may have hurt them, but you didn't sin against them. You sinned against God. They were the collateral damage of your sin, but you sinned against God. You may, have, you may have thought you aimed at them, but you aimed at God, and it ricocheted, ricocheted off and hit them. When that happens in our life, we, we at that point, we're not on speaking terms with God anymore. 
It doesn't mean he's not our father. It doesn't mean we're not his child. But at that moment, we're not on speaking terms with God anymore. Why? Because there is a sin that is that is fell in between he and I. And because of that sin being there and my human emotions being being what they are and how I feel about it, I feel ashamed to go talk to God. I'm not going to talk to God because there's something in the way. So I need to go and clear it out of the way. I need to go and seek his forgiveness. I need to go and seek his face and let him know that, that, that I regret having sinned. And I ask him to forgive me and cleanse it out of the way so that that res- restoration of that fellowship can can continue. I want God, I want him in my present, ever present in my life. I want to know that at any moment I can go to him with my request and that he'll hear me. You say, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, the Bible says over in Psalm, and I'm trying to remember where it's at. Um, I want to say it's in 66, 11, but I may be wrong on that. But where David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I just go on thinking, oh, I ain't a big deal, I, I sin, big deal. I go to try and talk to God. God ain't going to listen to me. Why? Because there's an issue that needs to be dealt with. God's not going to forget that I did what I did. It's going to be in between us. There will be no me talking to him. There will be, no, there, be no, no fellowship until it's restored. So forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Get it right. And notice what he says. He said, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Do you know what that means? That don't mean, hey, so-and-so owes me $5, and I forgive them for doing that. That's not what that means. That means everybody who has injured us, everybody who has hurt us, everybody who has done us wrong, everybody who has, who has viciously, maliciously injured us, we're to forgive them. I mean, those who despitefully use and abuse us, God says we are to forgive. If we want God to forgive us, we've got to forgive them. That's how we're to pray. If we go around in our hearts, uh, you know, I heard something this morning that really caused me some some concern. It was it was uh, it was like I was listening to Donald Trump talking, uh, or someone was talking about him. And said he he uh, if you do something bad to him, he will he will get revenge in spades. I thought, boy, that's not godly at all. That's not godly at all. That's the way politics works. It's a wicked game. I feel sorry. I, I think we ought to pray for him. I think we ought to pray for our president that he stop being vindictive. I mean, revenge is, the Bible says, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. But you know what? You and I, we do the same thing. We can sit and look at Donald Trump and say, well, you know, it's wrong of him. Well, it's wrong of us too. It's wrong of us to sit and think about something bad, wishing something bad would happen to somebody who's hurt us. But you know, that's human nature. But that human nature is a flesh, and that flesh is what gets between us and God. Forgive us our sins and forgive everybody that's hurt us. Forgive everybody that's done us wrong. And lead us. And you say, well, forgive them. Forget. Yeah, that don't mean go back and get hurt again. Have enough sense to stay away from somebody that's going. I mean, the Bible tells us to mark them which cause divisions contrary to the doctrine you've received and avoid them. There's a, there's a reason why people who, who don't love us, who, who, who seek to do, do wrong to us, there's a reason why we ought to get away from them. Not try to go hurt them. Just avoid them. Pray for them, but avoid them. And he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, please don't, don't let us get in, put into a situation where we're, where we're tempted to not trust you. Lord, why? Because our flesh is weak. That's why, that's why he's saying we ought to pray like that. Listen, we're, the Bible's telling us that we're prone to sin. So, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Don't let us get into a situation where we're tempted to sin. And he says here, he said, but deliver us from evil. He said, if we have to, and, and folks, listen, we're going to have to go down through that road into the valley of the shadow of death. There's going to be temptation. The Bible tells us that. But he says, Lord, please don't drag us no more than you have to. Please don't do that because we are prone to fall down. We are prone to sin. But deliver us from evil if you've got to do it. Lord, don't let it overtake us. If we've got to go through it, 
Pull us out of it, Lord. Deliver us from it. That's the way we ought to pray. And then he says, he gets into the part we normally talk about, which is the asking for things. See, we had not even got to that yet, have we? We haven't even prayed for self at this point, except the Lord keep me in a, in a state of fellowship with you. That's all it's been about up to this point. It's, Lord, you establish your kingdom and you keep me close to you. But let's get into this. Are we listening? Verses 5 through 13, I'm going to hurry. But let's pay attention. And he said unto them, he's given them an example. He says, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight? That's, that's, people usually sleep at midnight most times. Some people ain't, but most times people are asleep at midnight. And say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. Well, do you suppose anything had to happen in between going to the friend and saying something to him? I figure there was a whole lot of, don't you? Beating on the door, hey, hey, man, hey, I'm out here. Come on, wake up. I need you. Hey, I need some help. I'm sure there was some of that going on. He went to him at midnight, and he he said, friend, lend me three loaves. And I want you to understand something. We may find, we, when, we, when we read the story and we hear about this, and I know we've all heard the story, we've, we've heard it a lot of times, but I want you to understand, we picture, we picture an American home and somebody knocking on the front door with a screen door, or open the screen door, knock on it, whatever, and, and, and everybody's in their own bedroom, and, 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 you know, we picture it the way we know things. But let's go back and look at it from where Jesus was talking about it. That home wouldn't look just like our home. Everybody wouldn't probably be in separate bedrooms. Probably everybody sleeping in one room. And probably not just the people sleeping in one room. Probably the animals are in there as well. I'm talking about the sheep, the goats, whatever they've got, the dogs, everything. Everybody's asleep in there. Everything's quiet. Everybody's bedded down. And all of a sudden, here comes along. Hey, I need some help. Open up. It's going to cause chaos. It's going to cause chaos. He comes to him at midnight, saying to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, and we can go and we can, we can get all spiritual and say, Well, this is talking about the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and get all these types and pictures and all that. But that's not what I want to do this morning. It's not about the bread. It's not about what he asked for. He said, For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me. And I have nothing set before him. He had a real need. He didn't have any groceries. He wasn't expecting this friend. And this friend had a need. That's that's a lot like the way the way it usually is when the Lord tries to use us. Usually somebody comes to us unexpectedly needing our help. And usually it's a in it's at an inopportune time. We have to get out of our comfort zone, serve God. You ever notice that? God takes us further than we've been before. And I'm sure that was the case with this man here. I don't think he probably wanted to get up in the middle of the night and go bang on somebody's door and wake everybody up and cause a big commotion to get some food. It was just necessity. And so he said, hey, listen, he, I ain't got anything to feed this man. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. Or let me put it in. What are you doing knocking on my door? What in the world are you doing? The door is shut. I mean, I've been we've been closed up in here since eight thirty. Everybody's been laid down to sleep. Everybody was asleep when you got here. What are you doing? That's what he's saying. My children in with me in bed. I cannot rise and give these. See, everybody's everybody's sleeping in there. It's a, it's communal living basically. I can't get up and give you nothing. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he's his friend. He's not doing it because of friendship. It's not because it's not because he likes the man. Listen, he wouldn't get up and give nothing to nobody if he didn't have to. But why does he give it to him? Because of his importunity. He will not go away. 
Every time he tries to lay down, that man starts beating on that door again and hollering through that door. Well, if that happened today, what would happen? They'd call the cops on him, and the cops would haul him off, but that not in that day, evidently. I'm not leaving. I need food. Come on, man. Open the door. I'm sure the guy inside probably was having a fit. Ah, he's crazy. What is he doing here? Does he not know what time it is? Does he not have any respect for my kids? I got to work in the morning. What is he doing? Why did he open the door? Because he wouldn't quit knocking. He wouldn't quit. He said, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Whatever I got to do to get you to go out of here and go home. For everyone, here it is. Okay, verse 9. He says, and I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. I want to show you something. There's three different kinds of prayer mentioned right there. There's asking, and it shall be given. That's that's simple. That's, Lord, I need this. And God says, okay, I'm going to let you have it. And then there's the second one, which is seeking. That's not the same as asking. That's looking for an answer. You know, oftentimes we ask because we have a need, and we ought to pray for our needs. And God, some, uh, God in his wisdom, when he sees fit, will give us the answer to our prayers when we ask him. But he says we're to seek. And a lot of times we don't understand why things are the way they are. And a lot of times we come to God with questions, and we, we want answers. And we're to seek and seek and seek. And you know what? God will reveal to us. He will show it to us, and we'll find out why. So those are kind of prayers we're to, we're, to, we're to pray to. And then he says, knock, and it shall be opened. Lord, I need deliverance from this. Like a man who's bound in a cage. Lord, please, I, I'm begging you. Deliver me from this. And I love what he says after that. He says, for everyone. Everyone. You know, I noticed that word, those words in another place too. Jesus healed everyone. Lord, so good. He don't look at us and measure us to 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 establish whether or not he'll be good. He loves his children. The only thing that stands in between him doing what he said he'll do is our sin. And he says, everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. It shall. God promises. If we will be a praying people, we will be a, will be a people that gets their prayers answered. If we'll do it, if we'll follow his instruction, if we'll come to God the right way, if we'll seek God's will being done, if we'll come to him and seek him for the things that we need before we go out into this world to seek those things. We are to ask, and we are to go forward with and put feet to our prayers. That's part of the seeking, I believe, as well. It's not just seeking answers to things, but it's praying and asking God and then putting feet to our prayers and seeking God's will. God is not... I, I, I was telling Stephanie this on the way home last night. One of the problems we have with God is that a lot of times the only reference we have to what a father is supposed to be like, only I mean, well, he's our heavenly father, right? So the only reference we have to God is our own relationship with our own earthly father. And a lot of times if somebody has a wonderful relationship with their earthly father, they'll have a wonderful relationship with their heavenly father because they understand he's a good, loving heavenly father. But a lot of times if we grow up with a with an earthly father who's not very loving and not very kind, then our our mind tells us that God as a father is that way as well, even though that's not true. And we base that relationship off of our earthly father. That's not who God is. God is not like a man. God is not like a man in his nature at all. 
And he says so, and he tells us right here. He says, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Well, over in Israel, there are a lot of stones that look like little loaves of bread. The way, the way they look, they appear very much like that Middle Eastern bread that's baked. And, and it wouldn't be hard for, a, for a, a dad to give his son a, a rock and have him bite into it, break his teeth off. But why in the world would a dad do that to his son, trick him? Here, son, have a bite of bread. Break his teeth off on it. That's, that's what he's saying here. If he's asking, who, who's this a daddy? His son said, Daddy, I'm hungry. He would stick a rock in his mouth and break his teeth off. Ain't nobody going to do that. A, a good father wouldn't do that. He says, or if he asks of fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? And, you know, we're looking at, we're, these things are, it's kind of like, well, this looks like that. That stone looks like a piece of bread. It's about deception, you see. And there are, there are fish in the sea, there are eels in the Sea of Galilee, they're serpent-like, that, that look like a fish in, you know, in a lot of ways, but those things will bite you is what I'm told. I don't know. I've never fished in the Sea of Galilee. But there, it's, it's not inconceivable that one would be fooled, somebody handing them something that looked like a fish, but it really wasn't. Then he said if he asked for an egg, they offer him a scorpion. That was the weirdest one. But I was reading after Charles Spurgeon, and he was talking about uh, uh, someone before, that he had read after who, who said it like this. Scorpions don't lay eggs. Scorpions give birth, and, they, and the, they're like little worms. And it said that someone could take a little worm and put it inside of a bird egg and let it allow it to grow inside that and eat inside that bird egg. And then and hand that egg to someone that burst out, and, and and one of those scorpions from over there in the Middle East, which have a deadly sting, it's almost like a way to put a hit on somebody. You give a you give them a scor you give them an egg with a scorpion inside. I don't ask me how all that works. That's just what I read this morning. But uh, but it's talking about deception. God's not that way. God is not. See, my dad, my my daddy, and I, I think back to some of the horrible tricks my daddy played on me. My daddy handed me, and I was telling you this, Miss Charlotte, the one time my daddy handed me a habanero pepper. I'd never seen a habanero pepper before in my life, and he told me it was a mild pepper. He said, "Hey, have that. Try that. It's a mild pepper." And I stuck it in my mouth and bit into it, and suddenly my mouth was on fire. Now that's my dad was cruel. My heavenly father's not like that at all. He doesn't do anything to deceive you. God is not, here's the thing I want you to get, God is not out to do you wrong. God is not out to hurt you. God is not someone we have got to, to, to somehow talk into doing these things. God wants to bless. God wants to heal. God wants to fix. What stands in the way? Us. We don't pray right. We don't come to him with the reverence we ought to. We don't come to him seeking the right things most of the time. And we don't keep coming back. Lord, I need this. Lord, please help me. Lord, I need you, please. You may think, well, why won't God answer on the first time? I believe God wants to see how serious we are about praying. I believe God I believe God wants to God wants to see us. It's not that he needs to see anything. I want you to understand that. It's not that God needs to see something because God knows everything. God wants to bring us from where we are now into a better relationship with him. God wants to bring us from from this nonchalant attitude we have about prayer to a serious dependence on prayer. God wants to graduate us from kindergarten prayer to own up to middle school, own up to junior high, own up to high school, own into, into college and grad school of prayer. God wants to bring us forward and grow us so that we understand. Listen, there are people, and I'm telling you right now, I, I'm not saying he's anything more than anybody else, but I'm telling you, Richard Miller, evidently man can get a hold of God. God's healed him at least twice. It may have been three times he's healed him. That don't just happen. 
That takes a relationship with God that goes beyond what most people have in this world today. And it's not that it's that hard to have. Here's the instructions. Here's the key. We've just got to come the right way. We've just got to come consistently. We've got to come believing, and we've got to come daily, and we've got to come and get clean. He said, God, Jesus said, if ye then, he's talking to his disciples, he said, if ye then, being evil, and he doesn't mean they were just, their hearts were full of evil continually, and they just want to do evil deeds, but he's saying, if you, having a sin nature and falling down regularly, still know how to give good things to your children. You have a, even though you're fallen creatures, even though you, you, you fall down regularly, you still, when it comes to your children, you have a good heart in you that wants to do right by your children. He said, if you know how to do those things and, and give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good, shall give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? How much more will God in heaven, when we come to him and cry out for more of him, how, how much more will God pour out on us his power? How much more will God pour out his spirit on us? How much more will God pour out his favor upon us if we will stop being uh, uh, just sluggards in our faith, if we'll stop uh, being sloth, shout it out and give him praise to other people and let them know that God has heard you and answered your prayer. Because in doing so, what are we doing? We're encouraging others to pray. We're sowing seeds as we sang about this morning. We, if we want to bring in the sheaves, we need, you know what we need to do? We need to let others know God hears, God answers. God, when you call on him and ask him to save you, God will save you. He will do what he said he will do. And I know it. I've proved him. We sing, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him, o'er and o'er. Listen, what does that mean? That means I've prayed and I've asked God to come to my help. And what has he done? Over and over and over again, Jesus has proved that he'll do exactly what he said he'll do. All our prayers, all our failures, rather, are prayer failures. The power's out. The power's out in a lot of our lives. The power's gone out. What do we do in life the moment the the power goes out, what are we what are we apt to do? We're apt to jump and get on the phone and call the power company and say, "My power's out. How soon can y'all get it back on? I need my power on. Everything in, in my home is going to spoil in the refrigerator and the freezer. Everything's going to spoil. We don't get the power back on. The fish is going to die in the aquarium. We don't get the power back on." Grandma needs the power back on her breathing machine. Get the power back on. I mean, listen, it's, a, it's dire when the power goes off. Why do we not get panicky like that when the power goes off in our spiritual life? Why do we not cry out to the one where the power comes from and say, Lord, the power's out. Please get the power back on. I can't live without you. Everything in my life is going to dry up if, you power, if the power's not back on soon. We need to cry out to God. We'll never amount to anything without it. I'm telling you right now, Jesus said, here's how you pray. I mean, if you want to know how to pray, there it is. It's right there from Jesus himself. There's no reason for us to walk away from this message and continue on in our dullness. I pray for everybody here and everybody listening to me that we take it seriously and that we begin to work on our prayer life. Just get it, it, it. There's nothing burdensome about praying. We have it doesn't require effort. All it requires is us to, to give our attention to God. That's all it requires, and to lay what's on our heart out for Him. But there's something about praying in Jesus' name. Again, you and I, we're nothing. We're we're we are we are. We are despicable. We're horrible. The Bible says our righteousness are as are as filthy rags. There's nothing good about us. I mean, the Bible says there's none good.